ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau, te he maori ora. Ena mana, ena reo, a rau raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rau katou katoa. A kou wai au, a kou Richard Blake i tāka wingua, um, no kotarani te iwi, a uh, Hey, come out here! How to find one of our Taco Tena Koto Katoa? Kia ora, everyone. I'm Richard Blakey, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Enterprise, and it's my um, very great pleasure and uh, and duty to welcome you here tonight to this inaugural professorial lecture for Alex McMillan. Um, I will um, I will give a brief uh, mihi vakato um, tene te raro o te maru o kamana fenua um, kati mamoi waitaha kaitahu no mai hana mai uh, mai. I stand under the umbrella of the people of this place, Kate Mamoi, Waita, and Kai Tahu, to welcome you here. Kite Fare, Tune, Te Nakwe, Tu Tonu, Tu Tonu, to the house that stands here. Uh, greetings and may you stand forever. Inamata, Hairi, Hairi, Hoki Atura, Kite Po, and to those that have passed, um, may you go in peace uh, as you go into darkness. And I think with Alex's talk tonight about research that leads to advances in um, awful diseases such as cancer. Um, can we remember those that have been lost uh, before their time to such diseases and uh, recognize the value of the research that we do here and around the world to make sure that that happens um, as little as possible in the future. Um, um, and greetings to everyone. Uh, uh, ke ko um, rangatira e horaki uh, professors, uh, priest, PVC Health Sciences, uh, Matthew Sue Smith, Dean um, BMS, uh, Professor Cook, Head of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, and in particular to Professor McClellan, tēnā koe, uh, welcome and greetings to this uh, good occasion for you and your whanau, and uh, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou to your family and friends, Harry uh, and Lawrence, I think, your son and, and partner are here, and I believe uh, Dave and Jan, um, in-laws, are in uh, for attendance as well. So welcome to you all, I hope you enjoy the evening, and to, to those online, uh, no my hara my welcome, um, uh, it's a beautiful evening here in Dunedin if you're from somewhere else. You're missing great weather. Uh, as always, it's sun sunny every day, so please come down and visit us. Uh, finally, um, uh, ki te um, e horaki uh, e ke mahi te wharewananga o tāko, tēnā to the uh, academic staff and um, professional staff here at the university. Welcome. Uh, ki te manahiri. Uh, ki te otopoti, uh, te wai paunamu, te aotearoa, o te hohoe whā. Uh, no mai hara mai welcome to those uh, other visitors that we've got from the Dunedin community, from other parts of the South Island, from New Zealand and around, around the Four Winds. Uh, it's also my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Um, my role is to give a brief introduction to what an IPL is uh, and then hand over to Professor Master Sue Smith who will present Alex for his prof professorial lecture. These are very simply a celebration of the academic achievement of our best and brightest staff who have worked hard to achieve the pinnacle promotion in our, in our academic ranks, the promotion of prof to professor. This is not a promotion that everyone uh, gets to in their career, and that's fine. It's not, it's not an expected point, but it's a point that requires demonstration of outstanding abilities uh, measured against um, international standards. International referees are used to assess our promotion applications for professor in all aspects of uh, academic life, in teaching, in research, and in service. Not only performance at a higher standard, but leadership is expected. You'll hear from Professor Madhusu Smith more of the detail of Alex's career that has led to that and the leadership he has uh, demonstrated. But I just want to uh, highlight that, um, Alex, you are a very popular and effective supervisor at all levels. The fact that you take students into your lab as undergraduates um, as honours students, as PG DIP masters and PhD students, talks to your care for that research progression. Your teaching is outstanding and, and wide-ranging. The fact that you teach into some of our largest first-year classes and then up to and including very specialised 400-level classes shows and demonstrates your, your clear abilities. Um, and in looking at your research performance, you are uh, extremely successful and, I should say, a very... 
um, sought after collaborator and its collaborative efforts that lead to the advances that I'm sure we'll hear about tonight. So on behalf of the University of Otago, please accept our congratulations for this well-deserved promotion. A little bit delayed in you giving your IPL, I know. Um, and as I welcome up Professor Mattis Smith, please join me in congratulating you with some applause. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Lisa Marisu Smith, toko ingoa. Um, ko te tumua ki o te kura matai ko rongoa koiora aho. Uh, my name is Lisa Marisu Smith and I am the acting dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences and it is truly uh, my pleasure and honor um, to be here uh, tonight to finally, <laughs> well, I actually get to be here. If we did it earlier, I wouldn't have been here in this role, but uh, to finally um, recognize and acknowledge and celebrate uh, Alex uh, McClellan's uh, inaugural professorial lecture. So a little bit about Alex. This is always a bit of, of fun for me because you get to, uh, throughout the lecture, hear uh, interesting backstories, but to actually be able to go through um, and look, you know, all in one go at, at the impressive um, research and teaching record of, of our staff. Um, in the school, and it, it, you know, Alex is a is a you know, stunning example of that, and it makes me uh, extremely proud to be to be kind of uh, at least temporarily uh, leading the school of biomedical sciences. So um, Alex received his BSc at Canterbury in 1989, and went on to do an MSc at Canterbury, which he finished in 1992. Um, and then took a few years, uh, but you know, eventually came to the University of Otago um, and was awarded his PhD in 1998. He then went off to do a postdoc um, in Germany uh, in the Department of Dermatology <laughs> um, at the University of Würzburg in, in Germany. Um, and then decided to, to make his way back to New Zealand, pleased to say, um, and initially taking up a role as a scientific officer in the hematology and immunology research group at Christchurch School of Medicine. Uh, and in um, 2003, uh, we're glad to say that he came uh, here to the University of Otago here in Dunedin as a lecturer. Um, and 2006, was appointed to senior lecturer. Um, 2011, uh, to associate professor. And in 2019, <laughs> to professor. So uh, you're wearing it well. Um, and it's really lovely to uh, finally, fourth time lucky, um, get to actually have you presenting your inaugural <laughs> professorial lecture. So um, as we will hear, Alex's general background is in immunology, cell, bio cell biology, and diagnostic developments. Um, and um, he has been working uh, since 2021, doing some consultancy work uh, for SVB uh, Lyrink um, in new biotechnologies and um, has uh, five IP declarations made um, with oil here at the university. So uh, recognizing that, um, that uh, additional side of, of his teaching and research. Um, he has uh, over 76 peer reviewed publications to date. Um, and uh, a very impressive, in very impressive international uh, peer-reviewed journals. Um, he's brought in significant uh, research funding from external bodies, multiple grants from the HRC, uh, from um, Marsden grants, from Lottery Health and Cancer Society, and most recently um, he's leading an HRC project grant of over a million dollars uh, looking at dual safety system to promote CAR CAR T cell activation and migration. As we've heard, uh, Alex teaches at, at all levels um, in, in the school and across the university in our huge stage one papers and all the way through to 400 level. He uh, has supervised to completion 13 PhD students, six MSDC students, and over 20 honors students and, and many, many more. Um, um, dip size and, and summer students have, have worked in his labs. Um, he has, uh, in the department, been an outstanding um, uh, colleague and taking on service roles as the doctoral convener since uh, 2018. 
Um, he's chaired the teaching committee. He's been the overall 400 level uh, convener and, uh, and recently co-convener, as well as the um, MSC convener. These are jobs that take a huge amount of time and commitment and are really incredibly important for supporting our postgraduate students. Um, but they're often jobs that you have a, fi a hard time finding people to take on because they are uh, a, a pretty intensive um, role helping our students get through uh, all of the hurdles and so forth that we have to have to jump. He's also um, demonstrated a long-term commitment and leadership um, with the Animal Ethics Committee. Uh, again, a, an incredibly important um, committee for the school. Um, and in leadership in teaching and research uh, has driven the purchase of some significant uh, major equipment, uh, including the first in vivo bioimager um, to assist with cancer studies here at the University of Otago. Um, so as we'll hear tonight, um, I expect, and I'm certainly looking forward to it, uh, Alex's background um, generally and broadly is in cancer research. Um, and when he took up his position here at Otago, he continued to work in anti antigen presentation and cancer, but then stumbled upon, which will be interesting to hear, um, and clarified the role of cancer cells in activating uh, the coagulation cascade. In 2015, he reinvigorated his research direction into molecular biology to allow transfer of anti-cancer genes into T cells using retroviral and transposon techniques and now uh, produces recombinant proteins, uh, including therapeutic antibodies. Uh, his research on genetic sequences enabled a new platform to improve the ability of mRNA vaccines uh, for T cell receptors, and I think we all certainly appreciate uh, the significance of that these days. So um, sit back. It sounds like we are indeed uh, in for a bit of a ride to hear about uh, passengers in blood and skin, natural and engineered uh, immune cells. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor Alex McFarland to his IPL. Kira Koto, co Alex McClellan, the ho. No ata to Tahi Aho, I'm Alex McClellan. I was promoted to professor in 2019, and as you heard, I had three cancellations, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and to see everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Blakey and Mattisoo Smith for the very warm, heartfelt introduction and for organizing, helping organize the academic party. And I'm sure we'll hear from Greg and, and Patricia Priest later. Uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Passengers in Blood and Skin, and, and some of these cells will be important antigen-presenting cells that are involved in the anti-cancer response and uh, also have important roles uh, with combating infection. They're called passengers in, in my talk because they, they move around the body, and it also alludes to the fact that you can take some of the cells out and engineer them and put them back into patients, and these are the, this is the CAR T-cell revolution. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, my mother and father. So this is Alistair at home in a physics laboratory in Canterbury. He met uh, my, my mother Pam uh, in about 1947 on a cycling trip uh, when he was f finishing his PhD in Edinburgh, and uh, they came back to New Zealand and, and uh, began to raise a, a smallish family. This is them before they started raising the family, enjoying um, some of the outdoors, particularly the west coast, a lovely photo of, of, uh, of Pam and Alistair. And the affinity to the west coast um, stimulated them to buy a, a batch in, in Carter's Beach near, near Westport, where I spent a lot of my time. And this is me being incubated at the moment. My brother, <laughs> middle brother Daniel there, and eldest brother, uh, John there in those wonderful armchairs that I remember so well and the many kawai and so forth cooked upon the stove um, so very happy memories of that batch which sadly was sold but uh, that's how life turns out. Um, schooling, um, never great at sport, I'm probably better at sport now with the biking um, than I was back then but this is you know a test of endurance for every school kid is to, uh, back then was to do the sack race and that's in case you didn't recognise that's me 
Uh, coming last, probably didn't see the point of this activity. Perhaps we should bring it back, Greg. Uh, but what I was more interested in, this is me, um, on Cape Fowland, I, I believe, in the west coast, one of, those one of the wonderful holidays, a photo probably taken by my father on slide film. Uh, what I was really interested in was uh, the biological wor world. Um, I was lucky enough to have a microscope, uh, I think that was released from the university, it no longer required, it was perfect for um, observing paramecium and hydra and rotifers and the, the battle going on um, in, this, in, the, in the pond life, if you like. So I'd go down with jars to tributaries of the Avon River uh, and collect samples and, and spend hours watching those. And even my, my very sporty friend from next door was quite interested in that and brought it up just the other day. And another passion was insects um, of, of all kinds. And this Richard Shirell book I've still got, it was really um, stimulated my interest in, in invertebrates. And my father would bring home recycled notebooks. These were from students that had dropped out. So legs didn't quite make it through the physics program, but provided me with um, one book, which I still have. Um, so I would note uh, the hatching of butterflies, such as red admirals, in, in great detail um, using powers of um, of uh, uh, observational science only. Um, so uh, what, I was, what I wasn't aware of, um, although I wanted to be a scientist, was the, the problems of, of science. It's, it's, it's cutthroat. Uh, you need a high tolerance for failure. Um, and um, you might not all get all the data you require. And when you do, you might have to break it up to get it published into different aspects. And then in the end, someone, someone steals it. So if you like dogs, you might enjoy the, this video where it's a bit of role play about what, what science means. And you see the look of disappointment as Sprocket's been scooped. Clearly the data's been stolen. Someone else had been watching and, and had already had the same idea and had done it far cheap, cheaper. Uh, so uh, becoming a real scientist um, after completing a, a bachelor degree was enabled by Chris Mahanty, who took me into his lab for a master's degree. Chris had a really special lab. He had an autoclave inside his lab, and this was after the um, at math back then had, uh, had enforced more regulations about biocontrol and so forth. Um, so Chris was an expert and was Harvard, Harvard trained in the genetics of, uh, of, of many types of different bacteria and had many different interests in radiation damage of eukaryotes and so forth. He's a very interesting man. He lives, um, in fact, I've been in correspondence with him recently to get the photo and, and is happily retired over in Sydney. Uh, Chris noted very early on when I was a master's student that I was a terrible public speaker. I was a bag of nerves um, and uh, doing what you should do as a supervisor, you know, strict supervisor. You organise a talk for the Royal Society, um, which is m more people than are here tonight, but um, it did cure me somewhat, but I think the, I found the small tutorials more intimidating than larger audiences. Let's hope that continues. But I always remember, if I get intimidated, I always remember Chris uh, at the back of the room, nodding furiously in an enthusiastic way to try and encourage me. So thanks for that, Chris. So that, that was completed. Um, I, I think I didn't muck around much before I was looking for a PhD. And lying around Chris's office were lots of nature journals. And then when you open a nature journal, it's multidisciplinary. And I turned to the immunology pages and think, well, that's probably an area I, I do want to get into. And this job just came up out of the blue. It was a junior research fellow, very poorly paid in those days, of course. But um, it was um, a, a position offered by, by Derek Hart, who was provided some of the first descriptions when he was in Oxford of what causes the transplant reaction. And it was known that there were these major histocompatibility molecules, but it wasn't really known what cells they were on that were inducing the graft rejection. 
And Derek made an unusual discovery that antibodies against MHC uh, surprisingly prolonged the graft um, in the recipient. So it was a contrary observation and led to the dis uh, discovery of a type of white blood cell. It's called passenger because it comes in with the graft. So it's when you, when you put a graft into a recipient, the white blood cells come in too, and the dendritic cells are the ones that have these MHC molecules on that stimulate the graft rejection, which is a, a bad thing. You need immunosuppressants, and you need to try and match the genetics of the MHC as closely as possible. So dendritic cells are right at the start of the immune response. So if you think of vaccines and pathogens coming in, this is probably the heaviest science we're going to get into tonight, uh, dendritic cells handle all those, and we call those particles antigens. And those particles of antigen, which usually um, we, we think of from vaccines or, or invading pathogens, come into the dendritic cell, and the dendritic cell will stimulate some arms of the immune response. Because white blood cells are, are numerous in their, type, in their subset types, they'll do different jobs in the immune system. And of course you get the wonderful output there of antibodies, these are called cytotoxic T cells, and they will kill virus-infected cells. So we obviously rely on them if we've got something like COVID infection or influenza. But they also have a role in killing cancer cells, and this occurs naturally um, during our lifetimes, many times over. Saves, uh, these cells save our lives without us even being aware that some of these cells have killed some developing clusters of, of cancer cells. They'll also kill transplanted cells, and all the T cells participate in an inflammatory role um, against, against the transplant. So the dendritic cell is a critical cell, cell for that. And I've tried to represent the fact it's laden with different types of MHC. It really is one of the richest cells um, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, MHC content. Uh, Derek made those discoveries using, using kidneys, and, but was interested in the dendritic cell that was found throughout, throughout the body. And um, I was looking at blood dendritic cells, but I also um, asked Derek, I think it was my idea at least, uh, could I study the skin dendritic cell? And uh, this was um, not a very well developed technique. There were papers available which were very vague, usually from France, and gave no clue how you would isolate this, these tissue dendritic cells. And there was a frustrating uh, almost a year, I think, of complete frustration being unable to uh, um, isolate the dendritic cells we needed for the study. But I, I, I qu quickly, uh, after, after those frustrations, asked Derek, just please get me a skin grafting knife. Um, why would a PhD student want a skin grafting knife? It sounds dangerous, but it was really to make paper thin um, uh, uh, preparations of skin so they can be easily digested, and that's absolute key for doing that. But when you get a large piece of skin from the plastic surgeon, um, it's very difficult to work with, so you need something called, a, I, I invented it for, for myself, called the skin roller. Um, that's the Mark I. And the Mark II is, I convinced the um, medical engineers to get one that will actually roll around comfortably so I can get the, the silver skin grafting knife, which conveniently takes razor blades, and you'll need several razor blades for each preparation of skin, because skin's really tough, so you, you, you'd blunt it. But anyway, this, this appeared to work, um, and out popped these, these beautiful dendritic cells. So I was very, very pleased when I started the, getting the, the technique working. And this slide was, was part of my thesis and was published in Journal of Investigative Dermatology. And it shows um, a population of, of dendritic cells. And they, they, they love eating stuff. They love eating microbes. They eat whatever's turning over in the skin. In this case, some melanocytes have had their day. Um, or they're eating up some uh, pigment granules they just found um, lying around. So you'll find them full of unusual um, things that are just lying around in the skin. And these are probably uh, T cells. The dendritic cells talk, talk to T cells. So that was step one, if you like. Um, but an important step was being able to isolate skin, skin dendritic cells in sufficient numbers to be able to um, ask some questions about how they act. At the same time, I was looking at tissue labelling techniques, and uh, immunohistochemistry was a fairly advanced technique at, at the time. This is a long time ago. Now we've got fluorescence. But the advantage of uh, immunohistochemistry is you can see the, the dyes get into the skin as a, almost like a dust um, getting into the textures. You can see quite a lot of structure with those. 
Um, so I used this quite extensively and really uncovered the fact that skin appendages, follicles, sweat glands have these pockets of what we think are protective dendritic cells, which are in red here, talking to T cells. So they're sitting around the follicles, which are the potential weak points of the skin where the, the nasties could get in. Here you have pockets of activated dendritic cells. I was able to stain them with these newly identified antibodies at around the time and uh, see that they were talking, talking to T cells. It looked like they were talking to the T cells. So the skin appendages have these rich populations of dermal DC and, and T cells, and that was a new finding at the time. Up here in the epidermis, um, not so surprising, this is a skin sheet I prepared. You can see the dendritic cells in red, and there's lots of them. They cover quite a large surface area. So your skin, you probably thought it's just structural cells, is very, very enriched in certain types of white blood cells, and these are the passenger leukocytes that, that Derek talked about. Uh, having made some nice preparations of dendritic cells, um, the, my task given to me by my supervisor was to use all the currently available reagents. There were a lot of antibodies flooding into the lab at that time from, from around the world because we were part of an antibody testing workshop community. And the task was really to learn how dendritic cells switch on T cells. And, and this is uh, a dendritic cell here talking to multiple T cells, quite a promiscuous interaction there. Lots of T cells get together with one, one dendritic cell and they exchange information. And then the outcome is the T cells get activated, go off and divide and do all the wonderful things in the immune system they need to do, like killing virus cells or cancer cells, etc. So this um, figure shows that there's a, a few tentacles that, that sort of match between the T cell and the dendritic cell. They're like receptor ligands, like, like keys fitting into locks. And they have to be engaged for this process to work. If you're missing one or two of those, the immune system stops working. So obviously now they're useful for blocking reagents to encourage um, transplants to stay in bodies, or you can enhance some of those um, mechanisms by, by blocking them with some of the therapeutic drugs we've got around now um, to enhance responses to cancer cells. So at the time, identifying what these molecules were doing was quite an important um, task. And the PhD was um, a productive time. Uh, we, we had a, a lot of blood coming in from the Red Cross, and we were able to work from 5.30 each night um, processing the blood. The next day we'd have the blood um, pick it up on the ice and, and continue on. Um, we worked pretty hard. We had, we had uh, uh, good postdocs in the lab and um, I'm really grateful for my time, time there. And a number of these publications explain some of those receptor ligand interactions and they also show that some of them aren't there at the start. They are induced on the dendritic cell during the interaction with T cell. And pre previously, it was thought that those molecules were always on dendritic cells when they lived in your body, and we showed that that wasn't necessarily the case. So several of these molecules and their importance were identified in the PhD studies, and uh, they, some of these molecules uh, are obviously uh, clinically relevant, and you can uh, generate a monoclonal against, for example, CTLA-4, and enhance the immune response to cancer. When I was in the throes uh, of completing a PhD, so this was about 97, I would have handed in, I think, towards the end of 97, um, I got a talk in Venice, which was a big, big thing for me. I remember being extremely nervous about it, like I am tonight. Um, and uh, uh, the final night, uh, I believe it was the final night, there was a wonderful dinner at Hotel de Bain where Death in Venice was filmed. There's a von Aschenbach looking a bit shifty there as he's sitting in the, in the lobby. Um, but it was in this hotel uh, at, at, uh, after, after dinner, over, over a few drinks, that I met this wonderful person this, um, who became my postdoctoral supervisor. So this is Eckhart Kampkin, or Ecky, as we soon know he was called fondly by everyone. Um, he was a dermatologist. He'd pioneered isolation of tissue dendritic cells. I remember meeting him for the first time thinking I was meeting a rock star. Uh, he really was a, a, an amazing uh, producer of 
Journal of Experimental Medicine papers on the topic of uh, skin dendritic cells. So I was very pleased to land a postdoc with him. And we travelled quite a lot. There were a lot of conferences at the time, so these, this is us enjoying, enjoying some wine in Austria. And another thing about Würzburg, it's a nice, very nice city to live in if you're thinking about um, going over there. It's got good, good science, good physics, good, good biology. And we spent quite a lot of time there. My wife and I were alone for a time, and then Harry uh, was born um, on New Year's Day. And, uh, and that was about the, 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 in the year that we left Würzburg. So uh, we, we produced a, a German baby. He's not quite German because he's got uh, New Zealand parents, but um, it was also productive in that regard. So some of the, some of the um, work was really looking at uh, dendritic cells and we described uh, subsets of dendritic cells, clarified their function. These are just some photographs of different subsets of dendritic cells. Confusingly, they've got, C, uh, they've got names like CD4 and CD8, which you might associate with T cells if you knew about immunology, and that just goes to show how confusing immunology is, but dendritic cells also have some of these markers on their surface. There was a little bit of confusion about their functions, and I believe we we clarified some of that with some of the publications um, showing that those functions have, have different, um, different responses in stimulating T cells and they were not all what people had previously proposed they would be. So again, um, a, a productive time just being able to sit in a lab and uh, not, not be too bothered with admin and teaching and all the other things that happen in the university um, when you grow up. But uh, just, just uh, again, working hard with, with good support from, from Eki and, and the technical staff. So these publications were really involved with dendritic cell subsets, dendritic cell death, because dendritic cells have a lifespan. They're, they're primary cells, so they don't last forever. And it was looking at new ways that they could they could die. So the main findings were that subsets of dendritic cells have different capacity to stimulate different T cells, so that was an important finding. And the study ruled out some previously proposed mechanisms for, for those differences. And then finally, dendritic cells die, they have a limited lifespan. When they're dead, they can no longer stimulate T cells, so the immune system falls over. And that, I believe, is one of the reasons that uh, vaccination against cancer is, 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 is troublesome, it doesn't always work, um, and uh, there are other ways to, to treat cancer with immunotherapy that might be more, more fruitful. But certainly pulsing dendritic cells with tumour antigen, expecting them to give a good T cell response doesn't always worth, work. They have limited uh, lifespans. So um, after a period as a scientific officer, which um, uh, Lisa Madison smith alluded to, I, I was lucky enough to land a job as a lecturer in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and this is me um, on the seventh floor lab, which now is run by um, Matt Lieb Hussain. And uh, this is before it was commissioned, obviously, because we're not wearing lab coats, but there's a young Harry there getting a bird's eye view, probably of some tumour cells, not pond life, I'd imagine, at the time. And my wife, uh, Lawrence Fernley, there. This is dating me, isn't it? A wonderful view in that office. Uh, sadly, I had to go down to the fourth floor. Um, my parents, Pam and Alistair, there, so a um, little bit older there. Very pleased to see us back, as was Sputnik the dog, now deceased. Um, this is a little bit um, further down the track, because Harry's a little bit older there, but that's us in Christchurch, photo taken by my wonderful mother-in-law, uh, Wendy Fernley. And Returning to Otago, it's always difficult when you come back from a postdoc, what do you work on? Do you just carry the old baggage from your postdoc and bang, bang on that till you, you know, can no longer get grant funding or do you try something new? So I did a little bit of both. This was something new. So when you have cells um, and they're growing in the lab, you throw away the culture fluid when you harvest them. But that culture fluid's got some really interesting things in it that we started to pay attention to vesicles, which are lipid or membrane-bound uh, entities, are shed from cells. Um, molecules can be proteolytically cleaved off the surface of cells. There's interesting stuff in there, and some potential biomarkers. So this was looking not at cell culture, but looking at in the urine, or pee, um, and it was an idea I had 
um, when I saw that we could isolate and work with soluble forms of MHC called HLA-DR. And it, this is a paper just demonstrating its potential biomarker for acute renal transplant rejection. It's shed from the kidneys during the rejection episodes. So when the inflammation from the rejection episode uh, is, is felt by the other cells in that area, they release soluble forms of this MHC molecule. So that turned out to be quite a good test with good sensitivity and specificity, which means you can, uh, you can have a sensitive test but not get it wrong too much, like detect uh, false alarms, if you like, from, from those sort of tests. And we were also, at the time, working um, with, with cancer, and I kept also my love of, of dendritic cells, so we're plugging away on those um, at the same time. But when you look at a cancer cell, this, this is a, a shot from Amy Dunn, who's a technician in the laboratory. You see cells, but what you don't see are the things shed from it, and there are tiny vesicles shed from the surface of, of tumour cells. There are vesicles shed from inside the, the tumour cell by a process of exocytosis. Those are, those are called um, exosomes. And uh, most people just, just chuck those things away, but they are an interesting um, entity that we sort of stumbled upon, upon because we were looking at those vesicles because they'd been reported to be representative of the tumour cell surface and enriched in tumour antigens that could be used as a, as a therapeutic vaccine. So these are, these are tiny vesicles released from the surface and, and sometimes released from inside the, the endosome, which is something popping out by exocytosis. There's, there's a number of different subtypes of, of vesicles which we don't need to know too much about. But Remy had a look at the, the structure of these and um, this is a, a typical sucrose gradient that we use to isolate them. We can get them very pure and we thought we'll, we'll use these as a, as a vaccine at least and have a play around with them. But to our horror, as soon as they touched blood, um, there was this massive um, coagulation response of fibrin and, and a later thrombin burst was produced. Um, so basically you end up with a clot at the bottom of a tube. Um, you're unable to work with them in blood, which means they're not going to be a useful vaccine. So we um, were not too discouraged because we saw an opportunity here to, to really determine why were these so bad at clotting blood, because blood, blood clotting is bad. It occurs at a higher rate in cancer patients. So uh, VTE or pulmonary embolism are some outcomes, uh, unfortunate outcomes, of having particularly solid cancers. And part of that pathology could be related to the fact that these, there are these very, very pro coagulant vesicles uh, produced by, by the tumour cells. So I asked Remy to have a closer look at that. So Remy was a PhD student at the time, then he was a postdoc with me, and now he's a postdoc with Bruce Russell doing cryptosporidium. So Remy had a look at the vesicles in detail. And I, I was aware from the literature that there were some reports of various coagulation factors being associated with them, but pretty much every study had taken one coagulation factor and said factor 10 is involved or factor 7 is involved. And I asked Remy to look at all of them. Um, so he gained an exceptional thesis from that, but we worked him to the bone. And he did work out that the, the pathological coagulation occurring at this vesicle surface is naturally due to these exposed um, lipid residues called phosphatidylserine, which encourage coagulation factors to bind. But it was really just this uh, sniff of tissue factor, it's a tiny amount of tissue factor, which is a very, very powerful coagulant molecule present in your subendothelium. It's normally kept away from the, from the blood. That was the molecule responsible um, for this uh, pathological coagulation occurring by the vesicles. You could add a large amount of cells to a tube, it looked like pea soup, and so intact, intact cells, you wouldn't get the same response from just adding a touch a little sniff of those vesicles. So it was like snake venom. You might have seen videos of snake venom coagulating blood. It really was the same sort of um, phenomenon of very, very rapid and powerful coagulation response fr from those vesicles. So tumour vesicles are not going to be a good vaccine um, from solid tumours just used without any neutralisation 
of uh, those coagulation factors. Around about the same time, um, Sarah Saunderson uh, was working on a PhD. She'd finished a Bachelor of Biomedical Science in the, in the lab and published a paper from that work in Journal of Immunology. She was looking at the uh, exosomes, which are vesicles released from, from living cells, and looked at the pattern that they bound in lymph node and spleen, and, and the vesicles are in red, and she identified an uptake pathway for those vesicles. So the vesicles that Remy was working with and Sarah was working with, Sarah uncovered what they do when they get into the body. They're actually captured very efficiently by the reticular endothelium sy system, as we might, might call it, which is this network of macrophages um, present in lymph node and spleen. And what this shows is that the, the vesicles don't last very long in circulation. So you should probably be sceptical about reports of vesicles circulating for long periods of time um, in long, long COVID. I certainly am because of this rapid clearance there right down to the limit of detection, half-life of two minutes. So what are they doing in, in vivo? We never quite uncovered that. Sarah did a lot of work um, on, on their function, how they are induced, and showed a very important finding that exosomes which are vesicles released from living cells, are only induced if you stimulate the cells, if you stimulate primary cells, or if you turn them malignant with a virus like Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and I think the world still ignores some of that ad advice from, from those publications. Um, another aspect there was looking at the, how the immune system is activated by, by those exosomes. So, um, an another aspect that we have been working on um, for some time is that T cells are white blood cells that can kill cancer cells. And, and, and T cells are stimulated usually in, in physiologic situations by, by dendritic cells. And T cells during our lifetime, like other cells called natural killer cells, will kill off cancer cells. So we, we, didn't, we wouldn't even know that we had cancer. They'll kill off small clusters of cancer cells or individual cancer cells as they arrive, uh, arise. And persons on immunosuppressants after particularly kidney transplant um, recipient re receipt um, have a higher rate of skin cancers. So knocking these cells down, the cancers are, pop up. The frequency of cancers pop up quite markedly, particularly skin cancers and and, and recipients of, of grafts that need to be suppressed with immunosuppressants. So T cells, definitely important, but they don't always work. Persons get cancer, uh, people get cancer, and um, uh, the T cells obviously haven't, haven't done their job. So there is a technique that's actually surprisingly been around for 30 years, um, but it's only been in clinical trials for about the last 15, and now there are six FDA-approved types of CAR T-cell therapy against B-cell malignancies, because B-cells can also turn bad. They can form leukemias and lymphomas. And CAR T-cells attack those tumours by a mechanism different to chemotherapy or radiation. They utilise the immune system, and they can be effective against relapse disease or disease that is unable to be treated by the conventional therapy. So CAR T cells are just normal T cells, but they've been engineered with a retrovirus to have a single polypeptide or protein expressed, and that's the CAR. And the CAR will bind to surface antigens on the cancer cell. It's genetically spliced back here to signaling machinery, so it just, it's like a light switch just turning on that T cell that something is wrong. There are many of those uh, domains uh, that, that I studied in my PhD. Just the cytoplasmic domains have been popped in here to enable T cell signaling. So just triggering of this uh, antibody molecule here triggers T cell activation and, and will kill the cancers. Those, those are CAR T cells and they're very effective against uh, B cell malignancies. We've been interested in taking the CAR T cell, using it against the more difficult to treat solid tumours. And one of the problems with working with CAR T cells is if you look in the physiologic T cell expansion, what happens all the time in your bodies when you get an infection, T 
T-cells will, will divide and form these, uh, these uh, effector cells, which are like the weapons of the immune system. But with CAR T-cells, it's a bit more complicated. There's a few potential roadblocks along the way. You have to take the T-cells out of the patient, grow them up, put the CAR cassette into them using a retrovirus, and then inject them back into a patient that may not be feeling particularly well and has certainly had some uh, conditioning therapy, chemotherapy. So if these cells fall over, if they don't divide, if, if they don't persist in the patient, the cancer will come back. So it's really important to work out ways to encourage the CAR T cells to persist within the body. And that's what we're, we're looking at, ways to modify the CAR T cells to get the best CAR T cell product. And there's a little bit of room in the CAR T cell cassette to put some extra bits and pieces. And usually that's one extra gene which will increase the activity of, of the CAR T cell. So helping us in, in a large way was uh, the arrival of a, a student from Iran uh, from, who'd been working at the Tehran Stem Cell Institute, was already skilled in stem cells, uh, retrovirus technology, uh, molecular biology. Wow, what a PhD student to get in. Uh, it's like they've already done their PhD. So Ali um, contributed in a major way to finding out ways to get those CAR T cells to persist and, and not die and stay, hang around for long periods of time so they might be able to treat the tumour. So in a short period of time, I just want to highlight Ali's contribution to our program. Um, these are the papers he is, is co-author on. He worked on new systems to produce extra genes for the CAR T cells, these promoters, which are segments of DNA that switch on the transcription of, of genes. So if you want to produce something in a CAR T cell that's extra protein, you need a good promoter. So Ali developed a number of these promoter systems. He compared existing promoter systems and, uh, and uh, had a, a really, very productive time in the lab looking at those aspects. And one of, one of the aspects um, we, we were looking at with Ali was inducible systems. If you want to switch on an extra gene for a CAR T cell, probably it's better not to switch it on all the time. You might exhaust the cell, you might end up with a dangerous situation where the CAR T cell itself becomes malignant, becomes part of the problem, becomes a tumor cell. So an idea there is to have the, the, the gene controlled by a promoter that will only respond to drugs, or better still, can be auto-induced. So this is showing a tumor, and the the, these T cells have been switched on, a gene in the T cell has been switched on simultaneously by administering a drug. But as you can see, all of the T cells have been switched on, even those outside the tumour environment. So a far more attractive system that we're working on are these auto-induced cells, they're CAR T cells, they only switch on their genes when they're in contact with tumour cell products. This means that you don't get other CAR T cells that are circulating around the body, pooling in the spleen, for example, they don't become activated. They don't contribute to inflammation. There's less of a risk of, of malignancy from, from the CAR T cell. Another aspect uh, we've investigated, also together with Ali, uh, these bidirectional promoters for CAR T cell therapy. So promoters will stimulate the transcription of, of genes, but a lot of the promoters that we're used to studying in molecular biology labs, if you, if you um, put a gene backwards on the other strand, you'll also get reads. Um, so you can get very, very efficient gene expression from some of those standard gene promoters that people are using. And that's great because you can get two cars produced with just a minimal amount of DNA going into a retrovirus. So you've still got a workable system for transducing T cells. So this is an example of what we're working on at the moment. It's a car that has a double hit for a tumour cell. This tumour cell here has lost expression through mutation of one of those important antigens that normally CAR T cells would be 100% reliant on recognising. It will be a tumour escape variant. It will grow and form a new malignancy and cause relapse. So the loss of this is no big issue if you've got a second car that can recognize a second antigen. And for both of those antigens to be mutated on the tumor cell is a much less likely event. So 
Those promoter systems are really important aspects of our current investigations. And some of the papers published by, by Ali during his PhD look at the bidirectionality of, of those promoters to get a nice little compact system for inducing uh, CAR T cell activity. I promise to talk about engineered immune cells as well as natural cells, so this really is a, a, an overly engineered cell. This is a, a, would make a dendritic cell green uh, with envy. So this is an artificial antigen-presenting cell. So artificial antigen-presenting cells become useful when you can put in multiple stimulator molecules. Those ligands that I was looking at in my PhD, you can put them in as a single gene, one after the other. And Sarah Saunderson's done a wonderful job of making these artificial antigen-presenting cells that we've got in the lab. And they have a high expression of individual molecules designed to stimulate T cells or natural killer cells. And so you can use them for expanding cells before you put them back into a patient. So it's a real issue with some cells, in particular CAR NK cells, are very, very difficult to expand. Artificial antigen presenting cells can be used to expand those cells from, from blood. And this is an experiment performed by, by Lockie Dobson. Uh, using those artificial antigen presenting cells, you get massive expansion of, of cells, enough to carry out therapy with. If you don't get expansion, you can't carry out therapy. And mostly the CAR T cell world operates in production by stopping the production at the time you get enough to treat a 70 kilogram person, for example. So, uh, I'd like to thank the lab as it's evolved over the years. This is a, an older photo. We're a little bit more depleted in numbers now. Um, Lockie's just been added this morning. He's got a PhD scholarship. That's wonderful news this morning. And uh, so it wouldn't have been possible without the um, contribution of, of the lab workers. The department and the wider university um, provided me with a lot of support and encouragement. And within the department over the years, the support staff, particularly on the third floor, uh, which is the, what we call the class prep area, and the eighth floor, which is more the admin area, um, have really, really helped, helped me along. I'd like to thank particularly some of the lab managers um, in compliance and simply just keeping things going, Bruce Todd, Alan Clark, and now Alan Hughes as, as technical managers. Bruce set me up, um, and then a little bit later, Alan, Alan kept me going. Um, so this is when anything breaks in the lab, it's fixed almost immediately, or there's something happening to make you feel a little bit better about those next set of experiments you've got to do. So thanks to those people, um, and uh, particularly also the uh, other members of the eighth floor admin team. Long-term staff, um, so it's difficult to know who to thank, thank, but I've talked about some people tonight, Sarah Saunderson, Amy Dunn, Ali Hossini Rad, Remy Musen, Lydia White, and Josh, Joshua Halpin, who's just starting out on the HRC grant that we've got. The immunology team, uh, these are people that have been within the microbiology department contributing to immunology teaching, immunology research. They've helped with curriculum development, they've helped me um, develop my teaching portfolios, and they've been important co-supervisors co uh, and advisors um, for our postgraduate students. So many thanks to, to the immunology teaching team. Heads of department throughout the years, you can tell I've been here a long time. Sandy Smith hired me. Greg Cook continues to employ me at this stage. And my mentor is Chris Mahanty for, for the masters, giving me the little bump I needed for public speaking. Uh, Derek Hart, together with the postdocs, Barry Hock and Gary Stein, PhD. Eckhart Kampkin, and one more point I want to raise about Eki, he, he drove Lawrence to the hospital um, in the middle of the night when the taxis couldn't get up the hill because it was snowing. So he put chains on his Mercedes and drove Lawrence to the hospital so Harry would, would arrive on time and not at home. Um, and uh, family, incredibly important to me, and this is just the, the close family, Pam and Alice, my parents, Harry, um, Lawrence, Sputnik now deceased, Sprocket and Bat, the, the dogs you saw in, in the video, thank you very much to you for your support over the years. And uh, I think that concludes the lecture. Thank you.
uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you, Alex, for an absolutely amazing IPL. Uh, it must have been hard waiting the three years to deliver this and having all those cancellations, but I can tell you right now it was really worth it tonight and, and you covered everything that we'd like to see in an IPL. Um, I still remember meeting you on the eighth floor back there in 2003 as you contemplated coming to Dunedin and, and obviously we're extremely grateful that you did come. Um, our initial conversations were um, all one-way traffic. I didn't know much about immunology and, and Alex and I became running buddies and so most of the runs were about immunology so I had to really um, try and brush up on that otherwise the, the runs were pretty silent. Um, your talk tonight reminded me again of your enthusiasm for this subject. Uh, over the years you've also shown me that you're actually a pretty good bacteriologist um, and obviously training with Chris Mahanti who's produced some of the best microbiologists this country's ever seen so um, you could have gone down either road so it uh, just really shows your, your great interest in science. Um, tonight Alex has really outlined his seminal work in developing microscopic and cytometric techniques for visualising immune cells and human tissues particularly his favourite cell, the dendritic cell in skin and blood. Um, I hadn't realised how amazing your PhD research was. I mean, the number of publications that came out of that work is just incredible and really shows to me, you know, the endeavour, writing publications, I'm absolutely certain that, that you drove those drafts and, and, and got them through. I think that was highlighted again in your postdoctoral work in Würzburg. Once again, huge number of papers uncovering new aspects on the distribution and function of dendritic cells in interaction with T cells. Um, just every, every post that you've taken, you've made it a winner. Um, when you joined the department in 2003, you continued to work on antigen presentation in cancer and, and clarified the role of cancer cells in activa activa activating the coagula coagulation cascade. Um, you've trained a huge number of students. You've had some amazing postdocs. Um, probably one of the most pleasing things that's happened since I've known you, which is over 20 years, was when you said to me in 2015 that you were deciding that you were going to take a different path and, and that path was to get into the molecular biology of T cells, CAR T cells and I, I remember on that bike ride um, how enthusiastic you were about that and I think you saw tonight as soon as Alex segued into the CAR T cells the, the, the elevation of the lecture and the enthusiasm went up a notch. So, so you can imagine then we were no longer runners then because we were basically broken from that so we became very good biking buddies and quite often people would see us heading off to Signal Hill. Um, and so yeah, I remember that bike ride when you were saying I'm going to get into CAR T cells and I was extremely excited and, and I've also been very impressed with how quickly um, that you've dominated this field in New Zealand and basically now you're getting global recognition through all the papers that you're pumping out. Um, obviously the bike rides after that became all about CAR T cells and alley, right? So um, that was fantastic to share that with you. Uh, as soon as you turned your attention to that field, um, funding success was instant. Back-to-back um, -back HRC Explorer grants in 2017-19, uh, followed quickly by Marsden success and HRC project success. So that just shows you sometimes that, you know, you know, a switch to a different research area can be hugely beneficial. I thought it was an amazing opportunity and you took it really well. Um, as we saw, Alex has produced lots of outstanding PhD students and it's nice to see their work highlighted and celebrated tonight. Um, throughout your talk, none of, none of this should surprise you if you know Alex really well. He has a, an incredibly curious mind um, that never lets him take a break. He spends just about every night, weekends, working on problem solving, paper writing, grant writing, and, that, and that's not because he has to, it's actually because he just loves this, right? He's just so lucky to have a job and a passion that, that he really enjoys. Um, he still finds time to do lab work, which I, I think is remarkable, and in the 20 years I've known you, the passion and fire for your topic has never diminished. Um, Alex is no slouch, his Scopus H index of 32 is pretty amazing in this area, so that just shows you the calibre of research that he is. Um, not only is he a fantastic researcher, I know I'm covering some ground that you cover, Lisa, but he also um, does a fantastic amount of teaching and service. And I, and I just want to say a couple of things here because I, there's a few young academics in the audience and um, 
you know, Alex's service has been sustained, and what I mean by sustained is that he's been the MSC convener since 2012. He was our 400 level convener for over 10 years. He leads the way in the department for course advising of students. So if you ever need to know about the rules of engagement for university students, you have to talk to Alex because he, he knows it from A to Z. Um, so I think the promotion committee should look more carefully at the word sustained. And when making these ju judgment calls, Alex should be their exemplar, right? This is really what sustained means. Long periods of time done to a very high level. Uh, the other important thing about Alex, I'm, I've only been his HOD for three years, but he never turns down an opportunity to contribute. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him as an academic in our department and university. I enjoy the passion and commitment he brings to every aspect of academic life, and he pushes us all to keep our standards high. So he's constantly grinding at you to make sure that you don't drop your standards. So thank you, Alex. I mean, you really care about what's going on. Lastly, I just want to thank... Harry and Lawrence, um, Patch and Sprocket are not here tonight, but it's good to see them featuring. Uh, so thank you for sharing Alex with us. Um, I hope this evening will be fitting, a fitting celebration to recognise what an amazing academic Alex is. Uh, congratulations, Alex. Uh, thanks for your friendship. Uh, thanks for giving me lots of your old bike parts and uh, biking adventures. So long may that continue and, and all the best for the future. There's still a long way to go. So thank you very much.